church, welcome to Revival House morning service. We want to welcome you. And as we are about to enter into a moment of worship, I just want you to maybe stop what you're doing. If you're running around, just sit down and prepare yourself, prepare your heart for a moment of worship. So we just want to lift the name of the Lord high because he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wherever you're doing, just open up your heart. Say, Lord, I welcome you into this room. I welcome you into this place. Um, just come and take over as we worship you. Hallelujah. We have come for no other reason but to worship him. Oh, 
say we are here. We are here. Just invite him in right now and tell him that just come and do what you do. And Father, right now we set our hearts on you so that you can do so that you can do what you do. Because we believe right now that we are in a move. Oh Father, we Say, come on, this is a move right now. This is a move. This is a move, this is a move. We've been praying and we've been fasting this for a move. We need a move. We need a move. This is a, this is a move. Father, do what you want. and just begin to say, Father, I've been praying and fasting for it. And I know that this is a move. And I know that I'm standing in the middle of a move. I know that you are a God of covenant. I know that you're a God of promises. And your faithfulness will never, never fade. It's there each and every day. How I love you, Jesus.
put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and from foundation. You never let me down. Say, I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. I put my faith in 
you never let me down no no come on just open up your heart in this moment just begin to worship him just begin to speak well of your father begin to say something good of your father that great is your faithfulness oh and your mercies are new each and every morning and Father, we lift your name on high because you are a been, you have been a good, good father in the seasons of of trials, in the seasons of challenges, in the seasons, oh God, when we're down, in the seasons, oh God, when we're we're hopeless, Almighty God, you've been our firm foundation and you've been a good, good father. Where Father, we come into you and you wrap us in your arms, Almighty God. You never let us down. You never forsake us. You never leave us alone, Almighty God. Even in the times, oh God, where we we abandon you, oh God, and we run the other way. In times, oh God, where we do not feel like worshiping. In times where we feel, where we don't feel like praying. In times where we don't feel like reading your word, you're still a good, good father. You're still a good, good father. So, Father, we thank you and we magnify your holy name. We say that you are a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And we're loved by you. That's who we are. That's who we are. Father, we love you and we adore you. We love you and we adore you, Father. We give you glory and we honor you. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Say you're a good, good father. Say it's who you are. It's who you are. Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, say you are perfect in all of your ways. Oh, you are perfect in all. Still praying to us. Oh, we've 
ways are not like my ways your ways are perfect even when I can't see it you are even when I don't even when I don't like it you are oh even when I don't agree with your decision you're still even when I can't see what you're doing you're still perfect oh you your holy name for this moment oh God for even standing with us for walking with us for being with us even when we don't like your decisions you still you still walk with us even when we don't agree even when we don't see what you're about to do we can't see the journey father you're still perfect even when we don't feel like it, you're still perfect. Even when we don't feel like you are, we still know that you're still perfect in everything that you do. Because in every decision that you make, Father, you make it with the intention, oh God, of our good, almighty Redeemer. You do not have ill intentions or bad intentions, but you do everything in love. You do everything in love. You do everything in love. And that's why we worship and adore you. That's why we worship you and adore you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 yeah. We worship and adore you. We worship and adore you. We worship and adore you. You alone deserve my worship. 
When we reflect back on the wonderful thing that you have done for us, we are humbled by your goodness and mercy. And we are grateful. We are grateful. Hallelujah. 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 If you can just sing once again, that's Adonai. Hallelujah. 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 Let's give him praise. Let's give him praise. Let's exalt his holy name. Let's clap for him. We glorify his holy name. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. We give him praise this, this hour. He deserves it all. Hallelujah. Why don't you help me appreciate such a wonderful, wonderful ministration by the choir, by reading us into his presence. Please, if you can help me, appreciate them once again. Uh, whatever you are, whatever you are watching, help me appreciate them for such a wonderful, wonderful ministration. And uh, I just wish you are here with us. You can attest the presence of God in this house. God literally, literally bless you. 
Amen. Amen. As we come to the next uh, session uh, of the ministry of the word, I'm delighted to, to be once again in the presence of the Lord, uh, to be with you once again this Sunday as we come to glorify his holy name, as we are still uh, as we continue to exalt his holy name, uh, to hold on as we await the, the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We know that uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as the apostle said, it is nearer than when we first began. So may the almighty God literally bless you. And I believe maybe for the next 35 minutes, we'll be able to uh, uh, hear the ministry of the word. And uh, I believe the, the almighty God has, uh, has prepared for us that word that we are going to minister uh, uh, today. I believe it is a word that is go going to challenge you, the word that is going to strengthen you. As we be have begun uh, 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 for the last uh, two Sundays, about uh, this word, uh, we are looking at the area of prayer. Last Sunday, we looked at the key to answer prayer, and we are going to continue from there. And I have this confidence that, uh, especially the season that we are in right now, we know that uh, it's a season of prayer, and uh, the Lord spoke to us clearly in the beginning of the year that there will be need for us, especially as a body of Christ, to raise our bar, especially when it comes to the area of prayer. So, uh, it's a continuation of, uh, of this study of uh, key to answer prayer, but also uh, it's in line with the prophetic word that the Lord gave us for the year 2021. One of the things that the Lord spoke to us is that he, uh, this year we dedicated to more time of prayer and, and more time uh, of prayer and fasting, that is, and I believe uh, it's the most important thing for us to understand that the key, the keys that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that can help us to have those answer, uh, our prayers answered. But before that, we are going to hear the ministry of the word, uh, the prophetic word of the week, which is, um, uh, uh, as usual, we normally do it every Sunday. And the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, is where we get the prophetic word of the week. And I'm going to read it for you. Uh, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, uh, is where we are going to get the prophetic word of the week. And it says, he who believes in the Son of God has a witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has a son has a life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. And that's the prophetic word of the week. And uh, for those of you who are born again, we are grateful to God. We know that we have the son, so we have the life. We have believed in him. We have the life. But listen, yes, we rejoice on that. But no, we should not forget that maybe we have brothers and sisters who are not born again. We have friends who have not given their life to Jesus. We have work colleagues and neighbors who have not given their life to Jesus. So we know that if they have not believed in Christ, we know they don't have that life. So it is our call and our duty and our mandate, uh, especially in the season that we are in, uh, that we, we, we speak the good news. We desire many to come to Christ. We desire for them to have this life. Just like those of you who are born again, you know that you have that eternal life. It's our desire that those who have not given their life to Jesus, that they may give their life to Jesus, that they may have this life that the Bible is telling us today. So the prophetic word of the week uh, is talking about the eternal life. So, and, and I believe this is, uh, um, is a call for us believers to, number one, remember who we, who we have become. Now that you are born again, we remember who we, we have become. And we know and we have this assurance that we have eternal life. But having said that, it, it should not stop with uh, uh, the assurance that we have eternal life. But the need, there is a need for all of us as believers to uh, preach the good news. Let to, uh, to minister to others who have not had the good news so that they can, can have this eternal life. So it's our quest as believers, it's our quest as people, uh, those who call ourselves as Christian, to make sure that others who have not attained this eternal life, that they may attain it uh, 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 before the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So that's the prophetic word of the week. And my prayer is that we who have eternal life, and those who have no eternal life, it's our desire for them to have this eternal life. And I believe that the Lord is faithful. 
when he uh, prompts us once again, when he reminds us of our status, when he reminds us of who we have become, he also desires and he covets those who have not known Christ to know him so that they can be a partake, uh, partakers of this eternal life. Amen. Amen. So, right, going to the, uh, the ministry of the word, um, we are looking at some of the scriptures. Uh, 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 today we are going to do quite a reading, or quite a number of scriptures. And we, are going, we, are co we continue with the series uh, that we started. And the, uh, still the title remains, Key to Answered Prayer. Last Sunday we looked at some of the keys. We looked that one of the keys to answered prayer is forgiveness. That uh, it is important for us as believers. If we are to, uh, to have answered prayer, we must be people who walk with forgiveness. And it's not, uh, we, you know, we cannot escape this. Because in, in, most, in most of the scriptures, Jesus Christ spoke about it. There is a need for us to walk in forgiveness so that he can be able to answer our prayers. Then we looked at another key. Uh, uh, the key of knowing exactly what you want from God. We have to be specific. When you are asking God, we have to be specific with uh, what we are uh, asking him. And when we are specific, we know that we are going to get the result. But then today we continue uh, with other points that maybe we did not uh, address last Sunday. And one of the things that maybe I want you to understand is that, uh, and I believe this is a very, very, very important key for us as believers so that we can have command resort when we pray, is that we should know that God delights in our prayers. And he wants to answer our prayers. That God delights in our prayers and he wants to answer us when we call upon him. And that's why the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verse 8, it says, The sacrifice of the wicked is a, an abomination to the Lord, but the prayers of the upright is his delight. So the Lord, God delights in, uh, in our prayers. Uh, uh, he delights to answer our prayers. So, uh, and it's good to understand that, is, uh, that God is not that mean person. God, you know, sometimes when we, I, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I, I have this mind that maybe God is mean. That maybe uh, you have to do so many things to please him. Uh, that before you get answered prayer, you have to uh, kind of do so many uh, theatrics, do, do so many things. And because he's mean, he rarely answers prayer. And I, when I was young, I thought maybe that God maybe is, is, is very angry with us because maybe what we have done or because of what is happening in the world. So I, I didn't. As much as I prayed, uh, I, I, my mindset, of, of especially as a young believer, is that maybe God is angry with the world. God is angry with us. And maybe he is mean. Uh, he does not answer prayer uh, as often as we, uh, as we would like, us, uh, 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 like him to answer prayer. But I want you to understand this. Because when we can be able to change the narrative that we have about God, then we can command resort when we pray. And one of the things that we need to understand, key number, another point that you need to understand is that God delights in our prayers. And he truly wants to answer our prayer. And the Bible says, when you talk about the word delight, what does that mean by delight? What does it mean that God delights in our prayers? The, the word delight means Keen, that keen desire. And also it can also mean that great pressure, that God takes great pressure when we pray, when we kneel down to pray, when we kneel down to ask things from him. Uh, he he delights in that. And because he's the owner of everything, he has everything, he's the creator of everything, he created life. He, Bible says that he's the owner of the cattle in the thousand hills. Bible says that everything that we see was created by him. So he owns everything. And because he owns everything and he has the answer for everything, his delight is when we ask him, he delight to give us. Listen, all of us, I'm a father and I, I, I wish I have... Loads of money. Uh, I wish I have everything that anybody who calls me and asks me anything that I can be able to help. Listen, I wish I can be able to heal everybody. I wish I can be able to provide for everybody. I wish I can be able to be, give solution to every question that I'm asked. It can be feel good if, I'm, um, if I can be able to do that. But listen, I am human. I can only do much. But listen, this is the delight of God. He owns everything. He can do everything. He, he, he has sent his son uh, to lay down his life that whoever who shall believe in him shall have eternal life. He has sent his son that uh, uh, and he, the son was crucified that by the stripe that the son received on Calvary, we were healed. So God has the ability to 
answer all questions or answer every prayer because he owns everything. So it is delight because he has a lot and he has everything. He has delight to answer our prayer. And this should be our mindset when we appear before God. It's not that we are going to 50-50. Uh, if we answer, that's okay. If he doesn't answer, that's okay. We should have this mindset that God delight in our prayers, answering our prayers. And that's why the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 7 uh, 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 from verse 7 to 12, uh, it says, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what a man is there among you? Who if the son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a, a serpent? If you then being evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give you good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, uh, to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So the Scripture is telling us clearly there that. Um, that uh, we ask and it shall be given. We, we seek and we shall find. We knock and it shall be opened. And actually, just like the father, uh, uh, if the son asks for the bread, he will not give him a, 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 a stone. Just the, the, the way we would like to give uh, the right things to our children when they ask them from us is the same thing that God delights to, uh, to give to us when we ask him. And the, the, the same thing, um, the book of Matthew chapter 21, verse 22, it says, and whatever thing you ask in prayer, Believing, you will receive. So this is another assurance that it's the desire of God. God delights to answer our prayer. And uh, we, when we approach God before, uh, uh, with this uh, understanding, then we know that we are going to command great result. I'll give you two other scriptures just to, uh, uh, to firm up what I'm uh, trying to, uh, to, uh, to establish in your heart. The book of John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, it says, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The book of John chapter 15 verse 7, it says, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Consistently, the Lord, is, uh, the, the scripture is showing us that it is the desire of God to answer our prayer. And we see the revealed will of God to us believers is that it is desire to answer our prayers when we call upon him. And we should have this, the basic knowledge that God desires to answer our prayers. And uh, this is one key. Because if you go to God not knowing sure or for, uh, for, sure, uh, uh, for sure is going to answer your prayer, then you have already failed in, the, uh, in, the, in that area. Because without faith, it is impossible to, uh, uh, to praise God. And the Bible says that you know, it is through faith that we access the, the, the riches of God. It is through faith that we access uh, uh, God. Uh, and what does that mean? So when we, assure, we have this assurance that God answers prayer, then and, and he's delighted in answering our prayer. Then we are we we, we will not be tired to call upon his name. We will not be uh, 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 you know uh, we will not go half-hearted or we without uh, faith that is able to do it. We are going to uh, 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 to uh, you know to appear before God with this assurance that He is able to answer our prayers. Remember very well, prayer is important. Why is it important? It will, uh, we remember very well that Jesus Christ did not teach the disciples how to pray, uh, how to, to preach. He, pre he taught them how to pray. And that shows you the importance of prayer. So, uh, and, uh, and once you get this right, I believe everything else, especially the things that pertains to Christianity, our daily walk of faith, we know that we are going to command great resort. Another point that I want us to establish, and this is still a key that, uh, to answered prayer, we need to understand that uh, we don't need to, uh, you know, rem remind yourself, especially if you are born again, rem remind yourself that you are righteous, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Bible says here, and I, I'm going to, let me just, uh, you know, expound it to you more. 
Because most of the time when you appear before God, uh, not knowing actually whether you, you are the right person, whether you maybe you need a pastor or a bishop or somebody who has a bigger title or, uh, to pray for you, then I'm not saying discounting that people are not supposed to pray for you. Uh, your pastors can pray for you. Uh, prophets can pray for you. Bishops can pray for you. But I'm looking now building and raising Christians who can pray for themselves uh, uh, without necessarily always seeking for prayer. And I'm not saying praying, asking for prayer is wrong. But uh, the key thing is to grow and grow to a place whereby now you can, you know, there are some uh, things you can also be able to uh, pray for yourself. And one of the point number two is that you have to understand that you have the righteousness of God. Let me read you a scripture. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 16, it says, uh, uh, the, effectual, uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Uh, then uh, when you hear that, that the effectual uh, fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much, this is a scripture that most of us, we have heard the scriptures. I've heard it, and I, I've read it many a time, but for a long time, I, 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 it did not dawn on me, or it, I didn't have that revelation, what it actually meant, uh, uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Because most of us discount ourselves uh, and think maybe that you are not righteous. But the moment you give your life to Jesus, the moment you become born again, you are the, become the righteousness of God. In the book of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21, it says, But if you are saved, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. So when you become born again, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when the Bible says that uh, uh, the prayer of a righteous man availed much, it means that when you are, if you are born again, you are the righteousness of God. And because you are, you are, no, uh, you are the righteousness of God now, when you pray, you, are, you will command resort. Listen, the Bible does not say that, the, uh, that Elijah, uh, the prophet, was, uh, was a righteous man. It says, it says Elijah, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Then verse 17, it gives us an example of a righteous man. And this person now is Elijah. It says, not Elijah, but Elijah. It says, Elijah was a human being just as we are. In other words, Elijah did not receive answers to his prayer because he was a prophet. James said, Elijah was a man. So it means it's not because he was a prophet that he commanded result. It's because he was a, a righteous man. What, what does a, the word righteous mean or, or a righteous person means? It means right standing with God. Right standing with God. So it means when you are born again, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, according to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. So you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus when you give your life to Jesus, when you have become born again. So now you can make that fervent prayer because you are the righteousness of God. And when you understand that you are the righteousness of God, you have the right standing with God. You ask me, how did Elisha become the righteousness of God? Remember, those, those day in the Old Testament, people were called into that office uh, for a specific season. And this time, Elijah was a prophet. He was a prophet. So he was right standing with God because he was called by God. Then you ask me, Pastor, how uh, am, am I not, am I a, uh, you know, Elijah was a prophet, am I a prophet? Actually, the Bible says that we are the, the prophet, we, we become prophets because when we are called, when you become born again, uh, uh, we become, you know, the, the prophetic side of us is, is activated. Bible says that we have come to the kingdom of kings and priests. The kingdom of kings and priests. So we have been called out. We are the righteousness of God. Just like Elijah was called out among many others, he was called out. So he was the righteousness of God at that point because he was called out. Uh, uh, by God. So we are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So we can, uh, when we make our prayers, we must have this assurance. Just like James is telling us that the, effect, uh, the, 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 the effective prayer, the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. So your prayer, now that you are a child of God, now that you are born again, your prayer will avail much and you shall command resort. Amen. Then point number three, as we continue. 
Point number three is that we need to fight the good fight of faith. I know I, I touched this briefly last Sunday, but I want to, uh, uh, to go there again. We need to fight the good fight of faith. If we are to command resort, we need to fight a good fight of faith. This is not physical fight. We are not warring against flesh and blood, but uh, against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness. And the, we need to understand how to fight the good fight of faith. In the book of First, Peter, uh, First Timothy, chapter six, verse twelve, it says, uh, uh, "It says the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith." So we need to understand how do we fight the good fight? Uh, why do we fight the good fight of faith? One thing we need to understand: the Bible will not tell us to fight the good fight of faith. If there is no hindrance, we need to understand the reason why the Bible tells us fight the good fight of faith is because even as we desire result, even as we desire to command result, there is the enemy will always bring, uh, like to bring hindrances and uh, or maybe even bring delay in your uh, in your uh, when God you know in your uh, in the answers that you are believing God uh, to give you. And uh, unfortunately, most of us are okay to fight. If, for example, if somebody tells you, uh, 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 I'm, I'm taking away your car, I'm taking away what you have, believe you me, you will fight. And as much as, the, uh, just as the way we, we, are, we fight for the physical things, when we know that they are, uh, somebody is threatening to take them away, it is the same way we are supposed to fight for the spiritual things that the Lord has spoken to us. So when the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith, it means we, even as we desire to see the manifestation of the thing that the Lord has spoken to us, we, it is, uh, we, we need to make that fight. But then we need to ask ourselves, how do we uh, fight the good fight of faith? One, I, one thing I, we can say, and if you are taking notes, you can write down, fighting the good fight of faith is speaking the word out of your mouth that you believe in your heart, or we, in this case, we can say your spirit. So, we're, we're fighting the good fight of faith is to speaking the word of God that you have hidden in your heart. Remember what the Bible says in the book of Psalms 119 verse 11. David said, I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. So, it is the word that you have hidden in your heart. And when you begin to verbalize that word, that is a f good fight of faith. When you speak what the word of God says, when you speak uh, that word that uh, you, you have believed in your heart. Because there's one thing, you can say things, uh, but they will not perform if you have not believed them. And that's why now the meditation of the word of God makes sense in your life. Whereby you have meditated the word of God, you have become one with the word. So when you speak it, you're not just speaking it out like any other word. You are speaking it as a word that is going to command resort. Why is it going to bring uh, command resort? Because it, has, it is part of you. You have become one with the word. And then when you verbalize it, with your, uh, uh, when you verbalize it, a command resort because uh, uh, the word of God is, is your sword. I believe you, 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 uh, according to the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 4, we know that the word of God is a sword. And this is the what we wage war with. When you speak the word of God, it is like flashing the sword. It is like uh, wield, wield, wielding the sword against the forces of darkness. So when we wage war with the word, it means that we are speaking what the word of God says. And when you speak the word of God with revelation and understanding that the word of God is a sword of the spirit, then it, has not, it shall command resort and you shall see great resort. The enemy now realizes that this person knows who he is and he knows how to use the spiritual weapons. And one of the spiritual, the, the spiritual weapons that we are talking about here, it is the word of God that we, uh, we uh, when we verbalize it, when we speak it out with understanding and, uh, and uh, the, the, we are assured that it's going to command great resort. Amen. Amen. And listen, uh, I'll read for you a, 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 a scripture that... Uh, that may be another scripture that is still in the line of waging war with the word of uh, with the word of God. But in this case, we are also waging war with the prophetic. The book of First Timothy, First Timothy chapter one verse eighteen, it says, "This charge and admonition I commit in trust to you, my son Timothy, in accordance with the prophetic intimations which I have formerly received concerning you, so that inspired and aided by them, you may wage the good warfare." So you see, 
there is waging war using the word of God, but also you can also wage war with the prophetic word spoken over you or the prophetic word given over you. So, and we see, we ask ourselves, we, we looked at that and we see that, uh, we, we, uh, uh, that we, can, uh, we can wage war by uh, or fighting the, that good fight of faith uh, by speaking the word of God with our mouth. Uh, and then we can say now waging war with the prophetic. Still, we are looking at answered prayers and how we can command resort. And in this scripture, the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, we see actually uh, 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 Timothy being admonished by Paul. But then we ask ourselves, how do we wage war with the prophetic? The question is, how do we wield this weapon? Because it's a weapon also. Number one is that we pray it through. For example, maybe you are given a prophetic word, or maybe you've been praying and fasting and God gave you a word. This is a word that you wage war with because it's a prophetic word. And then how do you do it? We pray through it. Then number two, we decree it. We decree, we make declaration with that word. We, uh, and then uh, we meditate upon it. And I believe the first thing is, is we, uh, after we have done this, keep on meditating on the scriptures or the prophetic word that was given. Because the more you meditate uh, uh, that word, it becomes one with you. And when you becomes one with you, you will command great resort. Amen. So number one, how we wage the, the uh, war with the prophetic is that we pray, we pray it through. Number two, we decree it. And then uh, actually number three should be also we declare it. And then finally, we keep on meditating on it day and night. As many times as you can remember, you meditate on it. And that's how we are going to bring now the prophetic word that was spoken over you, we bring it to manifestation. So because once things are given to you, the enemy will wage war against you. Uh, and, and the enemy will try to cause delay. Remember what the Bible says in the book of Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 17, the parable of the seed. Bible says, uh, 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 part of this, uh, the, the parable is say that, that the enemy uh, will try to, to wage war against you because of the word that was spoken or the seed that was sown in you. So there is always the battle to wage, uh, the, wage against you because of the word that God has spoken over you or the prophetic word spoken over you. And this can go on and on. I believe maybe I can see, I've seen many Christians, even me, the, uh, maybe you have been praying for something. And when you have prayed for something, the Lord gives you a word. And maybe I have seen people underline their Bible that this is the word that God gave me in the, in the year 20, uh, 2015, uh, 2010. And you, you have marked that word. Maybe some of the word that God gave you, the answer has not manifested. But you know that God gave you a word. Maybe God gave you a word concerning the salvation of your entire family. Maybe God spoke to you concerning maybe uh, you have been believing for children. Maybe you have been, God gave you a word for children. And, and, and you know that God gave you. But the answer has not come. Listen, the more you keep on uh, praying through it, decreeing it, declaring that word, and also meditating, meditating upon it, then you shall command result of what God spoke to you. God is not a man to lie, nor a son of man to repent. What he said, he shall bring it to pass. And have this assurance that when you keep on doing these things, never losing your focus, never losing your faith, God is going to answer your prayer. Amen. And one thing that I love about God is that when he gives you a promise and he answers that prayer, that pr that, the promise never leaves your home. Never leaves your, your life. For example, maybe at some point in your life, you are, we are going through so many things. And maybe, God, uh, maybe you, are, you are put through shame, through, uh, puts, uh, maybe season of rejection, uh, uh, season of hardship. And maybe God give, give you a word. Assuming maybe God give you a word like Isaiah 54. And he said that I will never put you to shame again. What, do you know that, what, what, that, what that means? Even if though God answered your prayer uh, and, uh, and he, uh, he, he made a way where there was no way, or he answered that prayer, it means that now the prophetic word that you are given maybe even 10 years ago, and though it manifested, you can still revisit it. You can still use it uh, wherever you are challenged. Uh, maybe, for example, maybe you, you find maybe things are going to uh, becoming tough. And you ask yourself, and maybe you see that maybe this thing is going to bring shame. You remind yourself, God, you spoke to me, 
and you give me this prophetic word that my people shall never be put to shame. You say that I will never be put to shame. So you remind yourself of the prophetic word that was given. Because when the prophetic word is given, it is not supposed to leave your life. So you can use it as many times as possible. So at the promises of Bible said that the promises of God are ye and amen. So we can wage war uh, with the prophetic. We can wage war uh, uh, with the word of God. And we are going to command great resort. Amen. Amen. So as we come to the conclusion of today's service, I want you to understand those points that I've shared with you. And uh, uh, one thing, the best way you can be able to keep on waging war successfully is by always meditating on the word of God. Always meditate on the word of God. Keep your eyes on the word of God. I'll read you the last scripture as we come to the cross, uh, to the end of, uh, of today's service. Um, and it comes in the book of Second Samuel. Second Samuel 23, verse 9 and 10. Second Samuel 23, verse 9 and 10, it says, And after him was Eliezer. These are the, great, uh, the, the mighty men of David. And then uh, it says in here, in verse 9 of Second Samuel 23, it says, And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistine who were gathered there for battle. And the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistine until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to Pranda. Take note of that. Now this guy, one of the great uh, mighty men of David, his name was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite. Bible said that he defied the Philistine and he fought with a sword until his hand craved on that sword. That meaning that the, the, his hand became one with the sword. What does that mean? In, uh, in, uh, in uh, obvious, because this is the old, in the Old Testament, we see people actually literally fighting their physical enemies. But we see this is a big picture, a, a great picture that we can, uh, we, can, uh, we can understand that now the more we meditate on the word of God and we understand that actually that the word of God is the sword of the spirit that when we become one with the word, when our, uh, when we bec when, when our spirit man becomes one with the word of God, when we wage war, we shall command resort, great resort. We shall defy the forces of darkness. Because just like Eliaza, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, the way he held the sword and he fought, he defied the Philistine. He fought against them. One man by himself, he fought the forces of, uh, the, 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 of the Philistine and he overcame them until his hand uh, cre cre uh, craved on that sword. There's a big picture of how great resort we will command when our, when we, when our spirit cleave with the word of God, when we become one with the word of God. And when we wage war with this, now that the word of God has become one with us, we have meditated upon it. When we declare it, we shall command great resort because we have become one with the word. And the word of God is a sword of the spirit. Then the forces of darkness cannot be able to stand against us. So remind yourself, the meditation of the word of God, you become one with that word. And when, when you become one with that word, you have become one with a sword. And your sword is what you wage war with against the forces of darkness. This is my prayer, that you shall command great resort. You shall have great resort in the name of Jesus, that doors will open for you. Families will be restored. Marriages will be restored. Children will be restored. You shall make progress. Even in the midst of the crisis, you shall boldly say that though there were crises, I made progress. For that you can boldly say that this crisis is for my increase. That you can boldly say, if God be on my side, who can be against me? Remember, it is through prayer that we command great resort. We will win all our families to Christ. We shall command, we shall even change government through our prayers. We shall change institutions through our prayers. We shall win souls through prayers. And believe you, believe you me, brothers and sisters, when we are when we know, we use the art, you know, the keys of uh, of prayer. When we understand how to command resort, believe you me, we nothing that shall be able to stand against you, because this is a key that will bring the manifestation of the power of God.
to the world that we live in. Listen, the world is desperately for resort. And the only people who have resort is the people who know how to pray. Believe you me, this is our time. Things may look so hard and so difficult, but if we can go back to on, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, on our knees, we shall command great resort. May that be your portion in Jesus' name. May God give you grace. Grace, the spirit of grace as application. Let it be re re released upon you that you shall command great resort in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. As we come to the conclusion of the service this morning, my prayer for you is that may God may strengthen you. May God watch over your family. May God uh, restore the altar of prayer in the name of Jesus. May the Lord ex uh, you know, bring healing in your family as you stand in that gap through prayer. And may God bring great restoration in everything that the enemy has taken away from you. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. And as I pray, I also pray for those who are sick. I pray for healing. Whichever part of your body that is aching, whichever area that is hurting, I pray for you this hour. And I command right now, as the Bible says that by his stripes we were healed, I command that spirit of, sick, uh, of infirmity to leave your body in the name of Jesus Christ right now. Whether it is, your ba whether it is back pain, whether it is your uh, uh, infection, whether it is whichever manner of infirmity, I command it to leave you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. And still as you are still in that mood of prayer, I want us to commit those who are in the, uh, working in the front line, the nurses, the doctors, uh, uh, the care workers, everybody who is working in the front line, we commit you before the Lord and we pray the blood of Jesus Christ upon you from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. We speak divine protection. And we pray, may the Lord surround you with songs of healing and deliverance. And may the Lord take care of you and take care of your family. We declare you shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And we speak a blessing over you. Even as you have committed yourself to serve God and to, uh, to serve God through serving humanity, we pray for that grace upon you, even as you serve uh, in the front line. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. So God, shall bless you. And as we go on to the next part of the service, whereby we are going to celebrate and honor God with our substance. And I know that the Lord is a rewarder. He said that, uh, give and it shall come back to you. Good measure, shaken together, shall men give unto you and to your bosom. So as we go to that session, may the Lord bless you. Amen and amen. Thank you. Two men bring an offering to the Lord, one of the fruit of the ground, the other the firstborn of his flock. God accepts one and rejects the other. Why? Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. The word tells us clearly that the offering Abel brought was the firstborn of his flock. But it doesn't say that Cain brought the first fruits of his crops. It simply says, in the process of time, Cain brought an offering. Cain harvested his crops and over time gathered enough to bring an offering. It was an offering on Cain's terms. God accepted Abel's offering because it was the first of his increase. Cain's offering was rejected because it wasn't the first of his. Giving the first to God requires faith. When a firstborn lamb is born in a flock, it's not possible to know how many more lambs that you might produce. But Abel gave his firstborn lamb in faith, whereas Cain made sure he had enough for himself before giving to God. Many of us treat God the same way as Cain, 
making sure we have enough money before we see if there's anything left for God. Even if we give from what's left over, God can't accept the offering because it's not the first fruit. Other stories emphasize this truth. In the account of the fall of Jericho, the Lord gave strict instructions that the Israelites were not to keep any of the spoils from Jericho. All of it belonged to him, the Lord declared. Jericho belonged to the Lord because it was the first city conquered in the Promised Land. It was the first fruits. God withheld his blessing from Israel when one man took some of the spoils for himself. The first belongs to God. There was much more at stake than money when Abraham offered his firstborn son Isaac. When God asked for his son, Abraham didn't wait to have ten sons before giving Isaac. He gave the first when he only had one to give. Abraham had only the promise of having more sons. It took faith for Abraham to offer Isaac. Faith that God respected and blessed. And God did the same for us. He gave his first in the form of his son, his first and only begotten son, who was given to us while we were still sinners. God gave Jesus in faith that we might one day give our lives to him. The gift of his son came before the blessing of our repentance and salvation. We give our first fruits in much the same way. Before we see the blessing of God, we give it in faith. Giving the first fruits of your income says to God, I recognize you first. I am putting you first in my life, and I trust you to take care of the rest. Thank you so much as we come to the conclusion uh, of today's service. Once again, I really appreciate everybody for joining us uh, uh, today. Uh, help me appreciate the choir, the media, uh, the, everybody who has participated in this service. Uh, sometimes it takes a lot of sacrifice, obviously with the social distancing, uh, with some people also maybe coming from work. We really appreciate uh, for the great work that they are doing and we uh, we, we, we thank God for their lives. And I want you to help me always to keep on praying for them. Pray for the choir. Pray for the media team and everybody who is making this uh, a, a success. Uh, uh, it takes a lot of sacrifice and a lot of commitment, but we thank God that uh, that grace has been poured upon uh, uh, these dear ones. So as we come to the conclusion of today's service, uh, I want us to share the grace together. And if possible, help me uh, also share this, uh, this broadcast with somebody else. Uh, you can share it with your friends, uh, tag your friends, and also remind them of our Sunday services. And uh, we are going to give you also more details on other programs that are coming up uh, in the near future. We'll, uh, we'll be posting them on Facebook and all the other social media platforms. So may the Lord bless you. Let's share the grace together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Looking forward to see you again next Sunday, same time. And I believe uh, that the Lord will continue to keep you safe and watch over you. Thank you. And may the Almighty God literally bless you. See you again, and have a wonderful week. God bless you.